This is the seventh in a series of videos that retrace the life of Mary Rabagliati, one of Joseph Rosinski's co-founders in launching ATD Fourth World. After Mary had spent 11 years supporting families in extreme poverty in England, France and the United States, Rosinski encouraged her to go to university and prepared to take on more responsibility. Mary enrolled at the London School of Economics. I was lucky enough to study under Richard Titmus who pioneered the academic field of social policy. Although I had not wanted to go to university when I was 20 years old, a decade later, I could see that it would be useful for ATD Fourth World for me to learn more about how governments could design universal services based on need. One of my fellow students at the London School of Economics was a South African woman who belonged to an organisation that worked to improve understanding between the people of Great Britain and of South Africa. When she learned of my work with families facing poverty and exclusion, she invited me to go on a six-week study trip to South Africa. Since 1948, South Africa had been governed under a system of racial segregation and discrimination known as apartheid, a word meaning separateness for the benefit of the white population. Throughout the 1970s, the apartheid government in South Africa carried out the mass removal of 3.5 million non-white South Africans from their homes to 10 designated Bantu stands, referred to by the government as homelands. When I reached South Africa, I stayed in Johannesburg. My host was Il Node, a member of the Black Sash, a white women's non-violent resistance movement. The organisation is named for the black sashes that the women wear when holding protest demonstrations and speaking out against the erosion of human rights. My host's husband, Beers Nodé, was once a pastor of the Dutch Reformed Church. Because of his anti-apartheid activism, he lost his status as a minister in the early 1960s. From then on, he has been forbidden to preach to whites. He is still allowed to preach to blacks, but as the leading Africana anti-apartheid activist, he is constantly harassed by police. He has been banned since 1967, which means his freedom of travel, association and speech are severely restricted. The Nordes are often physically attacked by fellow white South Africans who support apartheid and disapprove of their activism but the majority of white South Africans simply close their eyes to apartheid and get on with their daily lives. My hosts arranged for me to visit Alexandra, a black township between Johannesburg and Soweto. My guide was an Indian man whose family has just been evicted from Johannesburg. However, he refuses to live where the government wants to send him and pays four times the market rate to rent a rundown flat. He told me that he feels torn between devoting his life to resisting apartheid or fleeing the country to give his children the chance of a better life. Black South Africans used to live as families in Alexandra. 
But now the government is demolishing their homes and sending the children and grandparents away to the Bantustans. Only workers are allowed to remain and dormitories are being constructed to house 60,000 of them. I visited one dormitory designed to house 2,000 women, although so far only 700 have moved in. There is only one entrance, which is guarded, and electric gates are installed within the building so that any part of it can be isolated at any time. Throughout my visit, I was accompanied by a white female guard. Many of the women in the dormitory are domestic workers who used to spend nights in the homes of their white employers. But a new law forbids blacks to sleep at their workplace, which is why the dormitories have been built. In them, women sleep four to a room, for every 14 women, there is one toilet, one sink and one cooking burner. No men are allowed in the building except in a visitor's room, furnished with plastic benches and tables. During my visits to the dormitory, I was careful what I said so as not to create difficulties for my hosts. But after noticing the expression on my face, the guard accompanying me said, I can tell you're against this. She tried to change my mind by insisting, these dormitories are a very good system. The women prefer it to living in the city, and most of them have been abandoned by their husbands anyway. She pointed out that literacy classes were offered on two evenings each week, and then took me to see the nearby social centre, though I soon discovered that it is used mainly to distribute food to the numerous victims of tuberculosis. There was a lot of rat poison set out, but very little food. One of the few services available to the women is contraception, because raising children is seen as a hindrance to the availability of the female workforce. I asked to see a men's dormitory, but was told it was too dangerous for women to enter. The men's dormitories are even larger than the women's, and they are full. Following that visit, I spoke about the dormitories with most of the black South Africans that I met. I learned that black people hate them and consider them to be a violation of family life. Unsurprisingly, they refer to them as prisons. They also point out that the area surrounding these dormitories is plagued with violence, including sexual assault. Even the guard who showed me around the women's dormitory finally conceded that it was a mistake to build such large dormitories. She said she regretted that the planning committee did not include a single woman. Unlike the United States, where people openly protested against injustice and racism, Mary discovered that in South Africa there was no freedom of speech whatsoever. Those who tried to resist were often imprisoned without explanation. The press was tightly controlled and there was a strong atmosphere of suspicion everywhere. No one here trusts anyone, because anyone could be an informant ready to denounce you to the government. So you always have to be very careful indeed of what you say. This creates the most oppressive sense of isolation that I have never felt anywhere. I met with four black anti-apartheid student activists who are in constant danger of being arrested. On the day we met, they heard that the police had raided their organisation's office, confiscated all their publications and closed it down. One of them meets with white women to tell them about their hidden realities of apartheid. She said, Whites ought to know what's happening. Forced relocations destroy our families and our roots. People are dying of hunger. We can no longer accept all these daily indignities and humiliations. Among the people I have met here, there are some who are in favour of apartheid. For example, a white Baptist pastor explained to me that he considers it normal and logical to separate people by skin colour. He could tell that I strongly disagreed, so he grew suspicious and began to question me closely on a number of political issues. Because he knew that my hosts were Il and Bayer's Node, I did my best to avoid answering. Usually, I'm completely frank. But during my time in this country, I have to be very careful because anything I say could be used against others after I leave. On Mary's return to Europe, she stayed in touch with friends in South Africa, 
but she chose her words carefully to protect others, because she knew that the special branch of South Africa's secret police opened letters and monitored activities in London as well as in South Africa. The most important thing I've seen here is that black people clearly have an immense potential, but this potential is mostly hidden because the adults must work such long hours that they have very little energy left for anything else. This is the seventh video in the series of excerpts from the book Quiet Revolution, the story of Mary Rabagliati and people the world forgot.